Hello and welcome to the third session of Telegraph Beauty School Series 2. I'm Sonia Harrier, I'm the Beauty Director of The Telegraph and I'm joined today um, by Dr Uoma to talk everything skin barriers and SPFs. So hello Dr Uoma, thank you for joining us today. No, thank you for having me, I'm so excited. I'm so excited as well because it's like, I mean skincare in the last 18 months has suddenly gone from being mm -hmm. something that people you know, it's quite functional for most people to suddenly, you know, everyone's using a retinol and a vitamin C and, a, you know, really becoming quite yeah. clued up on on skincare, which is amazing. But what I've really noticed from a lot of our readers and from a lot of um, sort of personal experience is that many of us have kind of overdone it a little bit in lockdown, whether that's with the acids or the peels or the retinols and, you know, almost compromising that that sort of barrier and that protection mm -hmm. of the, the face. I mean, how important is that kind of skin barrier, really? Yeah, it's super important. And even just to comment on your observation as well with regards to lockdown, everyone's become a skin intellectual overnight. I love the enthusiasm, but I think in some places, yeah, we've gone a little bit far. And so with that, a lot of people's skin barrier function has just been damaged. And you know the way that I like to describe the skin barrier function is that it really is the security gates of the skin. So it keeps out the bad stuff, lets in the good stuff. And so if that's you know, impaired or eroded through, say overexfoliation, washing your skin too much, drying out the skin, things of that nature, um, that's where you can get increased sensitivity, dryness, and even breakouts. Right, so if you perhaps have skin concerns like sensitivity or rosacea or or you know dehydration that can be made worse if you don't kind of protect that outer layer of the skin absolutely it's key right so um what are the kind of um key ingredients really that you should be looking for in a really good um day cream for mm. instance yeah again i think it we need to start with you know what's your skin type and what your skin concerns and once you acknowledge that and figure that out then you can sort of guide where you're gonna go with, you know, picking your day cream, because it may be a situation where there's certain actives that you need to look out for. So i.e. if your concern is hyperpigmentation, so dark spots, you might wanna to gravitate towards a day cream that contains vitamin C. Um, but generally speaking, definitely look for a really sort of um, medium or light to medium thickness moisturizer that sits beautifully under makeup um, and that is super nourishing, contains nourishing ingredients, um, and oils, um, if your skin can handle that. And also a little bit of antioxidant protection as well. So again, things like vitamin C, um, ferulic acid, all of those things help to protect the skin um, against environmental aggressors. Right, so if you're using kind of a vitamin C as a, in, in your sort of serum step in the morning, would you still need that within your day cream protection? Or does it kind of, as, as much as you can get in, the better? <laughs> Very good question, because I think often with skincare, people think more is more is more. And to a degree, maybe, but sometimes, usually, more is more is not a good thing. Um, if your serum contains um, an active, um, you really don't need to include it within your moisturiser as well. Um, but if that's your preference, that's absolutely fine, as long as it's not irritating your skin. Right. And, um, and obviously, when, whenever we speak to sort of skin experts, it's, you know, SPF is always at the top of the list mm -hmm. when it comes to, you know, all skin tones, all ages, men, women, you know, how important is that kind of sun protection year yeah. round? It's fundamental. I think it's a real sort of overlooked skincare product. And I think for many reasons, one of which being it's not particularly sexy. And I think a lot of people have a lot of history when it comes to sunscreens, whether it be traditionally um, sunscreens have made them look super ashy or they associate sunscreens with being super greasy in sort of formulation yeah. but it's fundamental because as we know um, UV rays from the sun um, really are the top factor when it comes to skin aging and so if you want your skin to look super glowy gorgeous um, and youthful it's really important to protect it with sunscreen and also a lot of the amazing actives that we love to use, such as acids, um, can increase the skin sensitivity to the sun. So again, if you're not protecting your skin, you're only gonna undo all of that hard work. And so, I mean, and we will get on to um, uh, product suggestions. We've mm. got lots of product suggestions um, to get through, but um, in terms of an SPF, 
should you always be going for a sort of 50? It really depends. So I feel as though sunscreen is a real contentious issue when it comes to our industry. Yeah. Um, my approach is, I would say, pretty much traditional and slightly laid back in places. So first of all, one of the markers that I like to kind of use when assessing and kind of selecting sunscreens, whether it be for myself or even my patients, is first of all understanding what Fitzpatrick type you are, so i.e. what skin tone you are. So definitely my patients have a more fairer skin type. Um, that's where I very much encourage them to use um, you know, sunscreens where it's a factor of say 30 and above. Yeah. But for my patients of darker skin tones, I'm a little bit more relaxed when it comes to, okay, you can use that SPF 15 to 30. And then the next kind of criteria that I like to use is the season um, and just kind of where you are. So um, is it kind of the depths of winter as we're approaching now? Um, or are you on a, you know, on a beach in Jamaica? Um, if you're on a beach or if it's summer here in London, make sure you're using 30 and above. If it's something, you know, if it's kind of more of a cooler um, climate, then you might want to gravitate towards 15 to 30. Right, okay. Um, because there's so much on the market, isn't there? There's like, I mean, it's quite overwhelming, isn't Very. it? Very. <laughs> Do you feel like you can get a really good selection of like, you know, day creams plus SPFs at kind of every price point? Mm, absolutely. I think if you asked me that same question 10 years ago, maybe not. Yeah. Particularly within the SPF category. Um, definitely from my point of view, they've been super ashy. And yeah, that's been a real deterrent for a lot of people with darker skin tones not to wear sunscreen at yeah. all. Um, and that's a real misconception. We absolutely need to wear sunscreen as well. Yeah. And which brands are you kind of, are you drawn towards when it comes to kind of, um, let's take sun protection to mm -hmm. begin with, mm. which brands are you really sort of drawn to and yeah. do you kind of really rate? Yeah, quite a few. Um, and again, all of the recommendations that I'm going to say um, are all kind of ashy free. So it's going to be great for everyone. Um, first of all, I love the Beauty Pie SPF. Um, so it's a SPF and a primer all in one. This has been a recent favorite and it's a um, factor of 50. The texture, insane, divine, um, great for all skin types, um, very light in consistency. Um, so it's easy just to either wear by itself or combine it with, you know, whatever moisturizer or oil that you want to wear. Um, next up, I love La Roche-Posay. If you want, you know, a brand that's easy on your purse, that's going to be amazing. Um, I particularly love their um, Invisible Fluid, I believe it's called, mm. and then also the Hydrating Creme, beautiful. Um, and then lastly, Supergoop. Supergoop's mm. an American brand, I don't know if you know it. Yes, I really like Supergoop. So good, particularly their Unseen Sunscreen. I love recommending the Unseen sun Sunscreen even um, to people that really don't like the idea of sunscreens but still want to protect their skin. Um, amazing, so all of these suggestions should be coming up into your chat bar now so you, um, you'll be able to kind of click on and check them out. Um, but yes, I use the La Roche-Posay, I think it's called the, yeah, the Anthelios mm. Fluid. I think I've used that probably for about, on and off, four or five years. It's Same. a really good, I mean, it's around a 15, mm -hmm. 16 pound price point. Um, and for the, the kind of technology that you get and the fact that it sits really nice under makeup. Mm -hmm. And you know, let's be honest, that is an important factor if you're wearing SPF every single morning. Part of the reason that many people are kind of put off is because they think it's going to like, or it's going to look greasy, or it's going to like, you know, um, break you out into spots, or, mm -hmm. or, or, you know. But it's a really nice te texture, isn't it? Yeah, it's everything. Yeah, and um, in terms of kind of really good day creams, we were talking about one of your mm. favourites earlier on. So, tell me a little bit about yeah. it. Yeah, so it's the Charlotte Tilbury Magic Cream. Absolutely obsessed, and I think you know, for the longest time, I just kind of thought that product was all kind of hype. Yeah. Obviously, it's been around for a, a while. I think I'm probably the last person in London to, to <laughs> try it. Um, but it absolutely does live up to the hype. What I love about it is that it's a gorgeous kind of medium thickness consistency. Um, it's got a little bit of um, sun protection within it of an SPF of, I believe, 15. Um, and it's really sort of nourishing, great oils um, within it. Um, and I have kind of a mildly um, oily skin type, but I don't find it greasy at all. And lastly, it sits like a dream under makeup. I'm wearing it right now. 
And I must say, I commented <laughs> as soon as Dr. Oema walked in, I was like, wow, your skin is so glowy. <laughs> and um, actually, we've had a really good question. So um, a, a viewer has asked, if you've applied a SPF 30 cream, and then a 20, uh, SPF 20 with a BB cream, mm. does that kind of bring you to 50 yeah. or how does that work? I was waiting for someone to <laughs> ask this question. Um, in short, no. <laughs> um, at best, you're just going to be getting um, a protection of SPF 30. Right. Um, unlike possibly other sort of actives, when it comes to sunscreen, it's not an additive situation where, you know, added 20, added 30 equals 50 doesn't work that way, yeah. unfortunately. And with, um, because a lot of sort of foundations and um, makeup products now have SPF mm. in them, is it enough to just have that? <laughs> no. no, that's a straight no. <laughs> Again, common question that I get asked yeah. in clinic. And of course, some sunscreen, particularly say within makeup and things, is better than none. So I'm not saying it's a bad thing at all, but I think there's definitely an over-reliance on um, such products to give you some protection. And um, particularly say, you know, if you're in a hot climate or it's summer, it's just not enough. Um, if anything, it's a nice kind of addition to an already sort of solid um, sunscreen base. And in terms of the, the real sort of noticeable benefits of sun protection, it's really going to help, like, you know, if you suffer from pigmentation or um, perhaps fine lines, um, is it going to help protect you from further damage then? Absolutely. So. Again, the sun is amazing in terms of, you know, giving us that vitamin D and also, you know, the gorgeous tan and glow that we all love. However, it's extremely aging and um, the sun essentially creates um, what we call free radicals on the skin. Um, and those free radicals, which are essentially unstable particles, um, then trigger inflammation, aging to the skin. Um, and that can then translate into obviously those fine lines, wrinkles. Um, those sort of added pigmentation. So yes, it's really key that you wear sunscreen. Amazing, that's very good to know. So um, we've also been asked about um, if you have rosacea, mm. what kind of SPFs should you kind of keep in mind um, for, for, for you know uh, rosacea type mm, skin tones? Really good question. Um, so a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, looking out for sunscreens. Um, that contain um, more of a drying, drying alcohol. So specifically staying away from such um, sunscreens, just because really with any skin type, but particularly um, a rosacea type skin, um, drying alcohol is only gonna further exacerbate um, you know, the skin. Um, next of all, trying to stay away from um, sunscreens that contain a lot of perfume, fragrance, essential oils. Again, that can be another trigger. And then lastly, um, such skin types definitely um, you know, will benefit from a more physical sunscreen. So sunscreens that contain zinc um, oxide or titanium dioxide. Right. Um, are there any favorites that you have? Ooh. A few. Um, so definitely uh, Medicaid to have a physical sunscreen mm. um, that, re that I really love. Um, and then also Ren. Amazing. Yeah. And we were just talking about Ren because it's one of those brands that have really nailed the kind of um, uh, almost a clean skincare. I don't like to use that term clean because, you know, nothing's not clean. But um, in terms of uh, a real stripped back, stripped back but effective formulas, mm. Ren have kind of nailed that, haven't they? They really have. And I'll just declare my love right now for Ren. <laughs> I think they're killing it within the skincare game. We were just saying that. Yeah. And I think they're really putting their money where their mouth is. And you know, really showing that they are serious about sustainability and more conscious formulations. Um, and they just have a great product range, particularly when it comes to, um, you know, moisturizers, day creams, night creams. And it's a good price point as well, isn't exactly. it? Exactly, so good. Yeah, and um, so if you, uh, as, as a sort of, um, uh, what would be really useful to know is, what is the difference between a sort of chemical mm. sunscreen and a physical sunscreen? Yeah, so really important um, sort of distinguisher to have when it comes to sunscreens. Um, so when it comes to more physical sunscreens, as I said, um, that contains, or even they contain things such as um, zinc oxide, um, so essentially metals, um, and they're kind of tiny particles of metals within the sunscreen, and they essentially reflect um, the UV rays from the sun. Right. 
um, versus more of a chemical sunscreen, um, which might be specifically the ingredient oxybenzone, which absorbs the UV rays and then can create a bit of heat on the skin. So nice. those are the two key distinguishers. Amazing, that's great to know. So um, we've also been asked, are there any SPFs that don't make your eyes sore? <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, oh, I really love, again, the La Roche-Posay ones. I find that they don't uh, yeah. make my eyes burn. Um, also, though, I think it really depends on the way that you're applying it. So, again, I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence, but just leave, you know, a real good rim around the eye, making sure that you're not applying sunscreen too close to the eye. Um, and then also what you, you can do, and um, you can also put a bit of setting powder to the eye area as well, and that just makes sure that you're not going to get any fall down. Um, so there's little kind of tips and tricks that you can do to make sure that you don't get stingy eyes at the end of the day. Yeah. But I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we've been asked what, what stage in your routine you mm. use SPF. So ultimately, it's the last step of your skincare, yes. isn't it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so sunscreen is going to be the last step in your skincare routine. Um, to be honest with you, and particularly when I'm in a rush, and I know many of the viewers are going to be that sort of a person, I often just mix my moisturizer in my hand with my SPF, and then that's it. Ah. And then it's kind of just good to go. So then you're not having a situation where it's like, Okay, moisturizer time. Got to wait two minutes for that set. Okay, sunscreen time. Personally, I don't always have the time for that. Yeah. So that's a quick and easy way that you can get both products all in one go. And if you have more kind of um, normal to oily skin, mm. do you do you even need a sort of day cream plus an SPF, or can you mm. almost go straight from your serum to an SPF? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So definitely with a more sort of oily skin type, and also particularly in the hotter months, I often just use. A sunscreen and that's it um, but I tend to gravitate towards a more um, moisturizing sunscreen so for example the La Roche-Posay hydrating creme um, that is a gorgeous moisturizer as well as sunscreen um, so definitely yeah I'd recommend that amazing okay so um, oh how often should you reapply SPF mm. if you um, if you have makeup on mm. and how would you reapply SPF if you've got makeup on? Really good question. So generally speaking, when it comes to the reapplication of sunscreen, um, we advise every two to four hours. Of course, it's going to be more so on the two hours front. If it's super hot, you're sweating, yeah. you know, you're playing water sports, you know, that's where you're going to be reapplying it more so every two hours. But in terms of if you're wearing makeup, if you live in the city, you're working, I don't expect anyone to reapply their sunscreen every two hours, particularly if they're sitting indoors all day. Yeah. Um, but if you want to reapply, the ways that you can do that are with um, an SPF spray. Um, so again, La Roche-Posay. Gosh, I sound like uh, the ambassador. <laughs> I'm not, I promise. Um, but yeah, they do great SPF sprays that are invisible. Um, so you can do that. Or you can actually get a really nice um, uh, sunscreen, such as the Unseen Sunscreen, and just put a little bit onto your beauty blender and just kind of press it into the skin. Um, and then lastly, there's SPF powders. Um, for dark skin eyes particularly, the best that I've seen in terms of SPF powders are from Color Science and Supergoop. Though I don't think the Supergoop SPF powder is available in the UK yet. Ah. But yeah, okay. unfortunately. <laughs> if anyone's going out to the US, yeah. keep that on the list. Um, I, I actually, I think I've used, I think Garnier have a SPF spray okay. over makeup, which is um, which I've used and was quite effective. Amazing. Um, I mean, the great thing about now is it feels like there's a real move towards more sophisticated textures, mm. isn't there? Um, we've been asked if you've, um, uh, if you should vary your SPF season by season. That's a really good question, and I do that. You do? Yeah, and I definitely recommend. Um, I think with all things, you know, whether it be sunscreen or moisturizers, you really need to tailor it according to, again, the season, and then also just what your skin is saying at the time. So maybe the days where my skin is looking particularly dry and dehydrated, that's where I'm going to gravitate towards, you know, a more sort of nourishing um, SPF. But the days where it's like, oh gosh, okay, my period's about to come, I'm looking a little bit oily and greasy, then I'm going to gravitate towards a more sort of lightweight, um, easier sunscreen. Amazing. Okay, so let's move on to evening routines because um, obviously when it comes to our, uh, cleansing your skin and using night creams or night serums or night products, um, there's a real, um, obviously there's a real 
sort of contingent of people who may go for kind of active ingredients such as retinols. Mm. But if you wanted a really cocooning, lovely night cream, is that still a good idea in the evenings? Um, it is, um, but I'm going to say something slightly controversial. Night creams are not compulsory. Mm. They're really not. And to be honest with you, personally, I often don't use a traditional night cream, to be honest with you. Again, it really depends on your skin type and your skin concerns. And the great thing with a lot of formulation these days, whether it be, say, a retinol product or a serum, they're often very hydrating, so you don't then need to add another layer of, of hydration. Nice. Um, but in terms of night creams, I really love the Revive um, um, Night Moisturizer. That's yeah. gorgeous. It's infused with things such as glycolic acid, um, and so you get that sort of retexturing, resurfacing of the skin overnight with minimal effort. Amazing. I mean, that's one of the key areas that you can kind of really start to see a difference in your skin, isn't it, overnight? Absolutely. Um, and so what kind of ingredients would you kind of traditionally go for in the mm. evenings for a kind of, if you really want to help to see a difference in your skin by the morning, what would you look for? Yeah. Do you know what I'm going to say? Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, an ingredient that I'm obsessed with, and I feel like I always talk about oh, it on my socials, retinol. Yes obsessed with retinol or I should say more broadly retinoids obsessed if you you know you're not using a retinoid right now go and buy one and use it ASAP because <laughs> it just has so many amazing benefits first of all if you want to look young forever that's what you need to use that combined with the sunscreen combined with the antioxidant game changer um, so yeah retinoids are amazing in terms of increasing the skin cells turnover um, improving collagen levels, hydration levels, and it's also great for things like pigmentation and also breakouts. So retinol is the first ingredient that I'd recommend for night. Um, and then second of all, as we've kind of touched upon, um, introducing acids as well into yeah. your nighttime routine. Um, so I love acids such as azelaic acid, mandelic acid even, lactic acid. Mm -hmm. Again, great for pigmentation, dullness, and just sort of overall skin health. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, I love, of course, hydrating ingredients for the nighttime. Um, I'm someone, again, who sometimes goes a little overboard with the retinoids and the acids. I'm sure many of you are guilty <laughs> too. Um, this was literally me last night just kind of packing on the hydrating <laughs> ingredients. Um, so specifically, um, you know, ammonients like, say, shea butter, um, humectants like glycerin, um, hyaluronic acid, uh, polyglutamic acid, um, and then also oils as well. Mm, amazing. I'm learning so much. I'm trying <laughs> to take it all in. Um, so w when it comes to retinoids, any favourites? Mm, this is so hard. I know. I'm sure you have a long list of favourites. I really do. Um, everything from sort of high street to more prescriptive. So starting with kind of high street slash more accessible um, brands, definitely Medicaid. <sighs> Medicaid is another brand I'm obsessed with. Again, I think they're really killing it in the skincare game. And they have probably the most extensive range of retinoids I've seen in my life. Um, and they come in so many different formulations, oils, creams. Um, and particularly, I love their Crystal Retinol range. Mm -hmm. um, there's at least five different strengths. Um, so there really is something for everyone. When it comes to starting a retinoid, make sure you start on the weaker strength and work your way up. Remember, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Yes, <laughs> amazing. So, and how long would you kind of, um, would you use a certain strength for before kind mm. of, you know, ramping it up to the next strength? Yeah, really good question. So I would say in terms of how long you should use a particular strength for, at least three to six months. But definitely your skin will tell you when it's time to move on because often my patients get to a point where they're kind of like, this isn't working anymore. <laughs> it was great in the beginning, but I don't see a difference. Yeah. It's not that the product isn't working. It's just that it can't give you anything else. Yeah. You know, it's kind of reached its threshold of amazingness. So once you hit that point, then it's time to move on to the next strength. Amazing. Um, and then in terms of um, kind of other regenerating or repairing mm. products in the night, are there any other sort of um, uh, favorites, whether it's kind of retinoids or acids? Mm. Um, definitely sort of ceramide lipid rich products as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I love um, some of Paula's Choice moisturizers. Yeah. Um, I love Dr. Jart's Ceramidin range. So that's a ceramide infused range, gorgeous. 
Um, and then also, um, for the life of me, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a pie oil. I believe it's um, infused with cacao. Yes. Um, and also has a bit of ceramides in there too. Really gorgeous. And so ceramides are... Are they like the building blocks, really, of the skin? Yeah, exactly. So they help to support the skin barrier function. Right. So we love ceramides. Ceramides are good. We love them. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, oh, OK, well, we'll get there. I've just seen another question okay. about SPF. I've got a lot of SPF questions. We'll get back <laughs> onto that. Um, in terms of a kind of night cream, is it quite, or a night product, is mm. it quite, um, should you some kind of alternate it sometimes or you know um, kind of see how your skin's feeling on on the evening or what mm. you feel like your skin needs kind of on the day yeah that's how I like to sort of guide my skincare um, again I don't expect everyone to be able to do this I think it really does take you know time experience and lastly just observation of your skin um, having a real understanding of what your skin likes doesn't like and sort of it's sort of I would almost say baseline appearance yeah um, so yeah, so I tend to take my skincare routine day by day, and then if I feel like it needs a little bit of hydration because I've gone a little bit OTT on the actives, that's where I'm going to use more nourishing, hydrating products. But if my skin's looking a little bit lackluster, um, or I've got you know maybe some breakouts, then I'm like, okay, let's go OTT with the BHAs and things like that. Amazing, because that's going to give you the sort of instant like glow. Isn't exactly, it? the nighttime can really be. Um, a great point in your skincare routine to add in treatments. Amazing. We've just been asked about um, any sort of acid recommendations. Mm. Are there any brands that you kind of feel really sort of do well at the acids? Yeah, quite a few. So I love the Dr. Dennis Gross Alpha Beta pill pads. Oh, I love those. So good, right? Yeah, so good. Um, and they come in multiple different strengths, something for everyone. And it's kind of an easy two-step um, pad situation. Love that. Um, I also love, again from Medicate, the Press and Glow Toner. What I love about that particularly is that it um, contains PHAs, which are kind of more gentle acids. Um, so again, going to be great for those more sensitive, rosacea type sort of skins. Um, yeah, those are the two acids that I adore. Amazing. And if anything's kind of not um, coming up in the chat box, we will definitely be sending an email tomorrow for any extra, because we're kind of got so much to cover and so much to talk so about. So much. <laughs> so you'll be, uh, everyone will be sent an email tomorrow with, with a full list of all the products we're talking about in case there's anything that we missed. But um, in terms of the um, um, uh, rosacea skin in particular, mm. so exfoliating is still a good option. You should still be exfoliating the skin. Again, it really depends on the degree of the rosacea um, slash redness. It really does depend. If, you know, it's a situation where you haven't got on top of it, um, any little thing triggers the skin. I'd maybe say approach acids with a little bit of apprehension. But if you find, you know, you only really get symptoms here and there, your skin is still somewhat resilient, the skin barrier function is still somewhat there, then yes, you can use more gentle acids like gluconolactone. Um, but of course, just be sure to maybe use it less frequently. So instead of traditionally every single day, twice a day, maybe just once a week, twice a week, depending on what your skin can handle. Right, so the Medicaid press, press and glow yes. would be a good option. Yes, absolutely. For rosacea skin types, amazing. Um, and um, we've had quite mm. a few questions about mm. rosacea. I mean, does it tend to, um, does it tend to get worse in the winter time? Does it matter kind of seasonally how you approach your skincare when it comes to rosacea? Yeah, definitely. So it's really important just to be aware of one's triggers when it comes to rosacea. I would even say to go as far as literally keep kind of a mini diary even of your symptoms and sort of triggers because sometimes what you think is triggering your skin isn't the most obvious thing. So indeed it can be anything from extreme temperatures, even spicy you know, foods, um, and of course, alcohol. Yeah, and stress plays a big factor now in our skin conditions, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, in so many different ways. Is that something that you've seen quite a lot in um, clinic kind of over the, the past year? Absolutely, and I think generally speaking, everyone's skin over the past years has freaked out um, due to various reasons, um, obviously beyond the obvious, um, but on a kind of more cellular level, um, those, you know, increased levels of cortisol really do trigger the skin in terms of, you know, causing it to produce more sebum. Um, and then also stress can have a part to play in disrupting the skin microbiome too. 
Amazing. So we want to protect the microbiome, don't we? Absolutely. Very, very keen. Okay. Um, and uh, with rosacea skin, mm. ceramide, are ceramides good? Yeah, absolutely. In your ceramides are great. Also, if you have rosacea, look up for um, ingredients that are very anti-inflammatory. Um, so things such as zinc, um, niacinamide, those things will also help to improve the redness. Um, green tea is another um, amazing antioxidant as well. Um, and then also kind of with regards to more general tips in your skincare routine, making sure that you're just sticking to very basic products. Um, I know it's really hard because everyone wants to try sexy products, the latest product, yeah. but unfortunately you might have to calm down with that. Um, just using basic products, um, minimally scented products, um, and also just minimizing the steps in your routine as well. And kind of generally, is that sort of your philosophy anyway, the kind of, you know, functional products that will actually work rather than layering lots of, because obviously we all see, you know, 12 step mm -hmm. skincare routines. Is there any science behind that or? Um, no, <laughs> not that I've seen anyway. I know it's very satisfying, you know, satisfying even layering on products. Sometimes I do it if I have a bit of time, if I want to do a bit of self care. But the way that I approach when it comes to sort of layering and just figuring out how to piece together my nighttime or daytime routine, again, I'm going to sound like a bit of a, a parrot, but starting with knowing what your skin type is, what your skin concerns are, and then lastly, what your skin goals are too. And then from that, you can then piece together what are the particular actives to treat and address those things. So for me, it's going to be things such as um, niacinamide, because particularly around my period, I'm more breakout prone. Definitely things like hyaluronic acid, because I have um, very dehydrated skin. Um, and then also retinol, because I have um, you know, aging concerns um, and also just concerns with regards to texture. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we have um, we have quite a few sort of male viewers as well. Is mm. that essentially a, a sort of routine that works for men and women? Absolutely. And all kind of age groups as well. Absolutely. Um, skincare really is a universal um, thing. Um, I think there really is a bit of a myth in terms of men have to use a particular routine and women. No, that's not the case at all. It's more so guided by um, your skin type. Definitely, I would say men will have or even more likely to have a certain skin type and you know concern, um, i.e. maybe more of an oily skin type, um, you know razor bumps, things like that will be more of an issue. Um, but generally speaking, it's pretty much the same. Yeah. So we've had a few questions um, about vitamin C because it's a hot topic. I mean, mm. it's a um, an ingredient that many skin experts and dermatologists always speak about. Um, would you use that? day and night, would you use that just in the day, kind of how's the, what's the usage on vitamin mm. C for you? Um, so indeed it is something that you can use twice a day, um, again depending on what you're trying to achieve. I'd recommend using it twice a day if you're using it for say pigmentation concerns, um, but generally speaking we tend to recommend vitamin C solely for the daytime. Mm -hmm. um, yes you get the added benefits of of course pigmentation, um, you know resolution and things like that, but also it doubles up to protect your skin against the sun and also counteract those environmental aggressors from things like pollution, which of course you're only really going to be exposed to during the daytime. Amazing. Okay, that's good to know. Um, any, are there any sort of um, high street or sort of budget beauty buys mm. that you really love when it comes to skincare? Absolutely. I love a good budget when it comes to skincare. Amazing. Um, so definitely, um, you know, everyone needs to check out the B Skin range even from Superdrug. Yeah. Um, and also the Me Plus range from Superdrug. Um, both really amazing price points. Me Plus is more sort of active focused. Uh, whereas B Skin, um, again, there's great actors within it, but it's more so for those who just want a really easy, um, sort of no fuss skincare routine. In terms of some of my top picks from that, um, I love the intense moisturizing cream gorgeous. I'm surprised it's so cheap. Um, really beautiful texture. And then also the intense hydrating serum. Amazing. Amazing. So that moisturizing cream, is mm. it a product that would work for kind of most skin types? Absolutely. The thing is, you know, when it comes to moisturizers, particularly thicker moisturizers, pretty much any skin um, type even um, can use it. What I like to say is just change the amount of product that you're using. So uh -huh. if you have more of an oily skin type, just use a tiny amount. 
<laughs> really work it into the skin. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and I mean, what's lovely to know is that you don't have to spend a fortune to get a really good protective moisturizer for the skin. Um, are there any other sort of favorites mm. that you... Um, in terms of high street, mm, I love Eucerin. Oh, so particularly yes. for those um, listening that have really dry, parched skin, almost varying off into eczema, Eucerin, gorgeous brand when it comes to thicker um, moisturizers. Um, of course, La Roche-Posay. Um, I love their Tellerian line, particularly their Tellerian Ultra Fluid and mm, the Creme. We've got one of the Tellerian Yeah, I think that's here. the Demalago. So yes. that's more so for sort of sensitized skin, going to be great for skins with redness, rosacea. Yeah. Um, the reason I love it, and as you'll see, it's just a really nice thickness. It's not greasy. And what I also love about it is that it's just very basic in the most flattering way possible <laughs> yes. because I think sometimes we fall into the trap that you know our moisturizers need to have a gazillion ingredients often they don't you can bring in the exciting stuff when it comes to um, serums and things amazing oh that feels so, so great good. and great it? under makeup too yeah and that's I mean a lot of these um, a lot of these products kind of double up as primers almost don't they for, for makeup they've almost become so sophisticated that they you don't feel like you need those, you know, extra steps in your routine. Absolutely. Um, so we, we're getting lots of um, lots of questions. Oh, can your skin be dehydrated and oily at the same time? Yes. And how would you treat it? That's a great That's question. That's a very, very good question. Yes, they absolutely can. And it's something that I see a lot in clinic. And also I experience this personally myself. And that combination of having oily skin, but at the same time quite dehydrated, often confuses people and then they then start to think that they have combination skin. Yes. No, more likely than not you have oily dehydrated skin. Truly combination skin where there's areas of truly, you know, oiliness and dryness on the same face is very uncommon. Right. I've seen it a handful of times in clinic and the very extreme versions, they literally have acne and eczema on the same face. Yeah. Wow. So it's not a common or as, you know, common of a skin type as people think. So with an oily dehydrated skin type, your best friend is gonna be more of those watery, hydrating ingredients. So as I said before, hyaluronic acid, glycerin, polyglutamic acid. Um, so using more things like that as opposed to oils, oils even, because of course you have more than enough oils on oily you know, skin. So that won't make the oil worse, essentially. It will just kind of um, make your skin texture more even, it? Absolutely. So, um, I should have mentioned when it comes to dehydration, really what that is indicative of is the skin lacks water. Um, so with that, you know, if you're adding, you know, very watery, hydrating ingredients, it's not going to make your skin more oily at all. Amazing. Okay, great. Um, and okay, we've got lots. Um, which moisturizers would you um, suggest are best for mature skin mm. types? Really good question. Again, the Charlotte Tilbury Magic Cream. It's just so divine. Um, also, Ren, um, from their Ever Calm range that we have here, they also have a really gorgeous overnight balm that's super thick, um, almost veering on sort of more of an occlusive texture, but that's going to be great just to repair the skin overnight. Um, so those are the two sort of thicker products that I love for mature skin. Amazing. And all those products nowadays mm. that are thicker, um, you're not going to... You're not, you won't get that kind of greasy finish, will you, on the face? Again, it really depends on the skin type. If you're someone with dry, parched skin, you're absolutely not. No. <laughs> um, but if you're someone with more of an oily skin type who really didn't need the extra moisturization, yes, you will look like a disco ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've definitely been there. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, Maureen has asked, how do you get rid of age marks mm. or age spots? Okay, so that's really more of a pigmentation, you know, issue. Um, so when it comes to treating pigmentation, um, I love to use um, certain ingredients that we call tyrosinase inhibitors. It's just essentially a fancy word for ingredients that interfere with the um, pigmentation producing pathway in the skin. Right. So I love things such as azelaic acid, um, kojic acid, vitamin C, of course, um, arbutin, um, and then also retinoids as well can really help with pigmentation. Amazing. Are there any um, sort of different retinoids that you'd use particularly for pigmentation mm. or, or kind of 
for the medicate, for instance, will mm. that help to treat pigmentation as well as fine lines, you know, and other sort of skin concerns? Yeah, absolutely. So on a cellular level, pretty much all retinoids, um, you'll see a benefit with, with regards to sort of anti-aging um, and then also pigmentation. But I do find, um, you know, retinoids such as, and again, this is more so varying on prescriptive, um, such as tretinoin, adapalene, those sorts of retinoids are better for things like acne. Right, I see, okay. Um, are there any creams that you can use at, the, at any time of the day, so morning and night? Um, mm, and should you, you know, are you kind of okay to use the same day and night, you know, day cream for nighttime as well? Absolutely, I do that all the time. And I think to a degree, I say this lightly, because um, I don't want to contradict myself. Um, but I think to a degree, the whole night cream, day cream situation, it's a little bit of a ploy to just make us spend more money and buy more product to mm -hmm. a degree. Um, yes, there's benefits in distinguishing them. But as you know, your viewer mentioned, you can absolutely use the same moisturizer for the day and the night. Again, um, the Telerian range from um, La roche is a great one for that. Right, and it's not going to, um I mean, essentially, it's just moisturizing the skin. Exactly. It's doing the same exactly. job, isn't it? And what you can do instead is have a bit more fun when it comes to the serums. So use a day-appropriate serum and a night-appropriate serum. And um, if you are using sort of active in the evening, such mm. as a retinoid or a, an acid, do you then need to cushion that with a cream afterwards, always? Really good question. Not necessarily. Depends on how moisturizing the formulation of that active is. Um, but a really good tip that I love to give patients is if you're someone that's new to retinoids, um, because as many of you may know, retinoids um, do have a little bit of a rep when it comes to causing irritation yeah. and dryness. To be honest, I secretly love it because I know <laughs> that it's working. Um, and I'm like, yes, I'm flaking. Because um, I know I'm going to look really cute in a few days after. Um, <laughs> but when it comes to things like retinoids, you can actually use a really basic moisturizer like the Telerian range um, as a bit of a buffer. And it just helps to just slowly introduce that retinoid into the skin, um, hydrating the skin at the same time, minimizing the chance of irritation. Amazing. Um, so another question we've got for a, from a, um, a viewer here. Um, what creams or skin treatments are good for white heads and black heads around the nose for an um, African with fair skin? Mm. OK, really good question. When it comes to textural issues, um, congestion, things of that nature, my first go-to, to be honest, wouldn't be a moisturizer. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it is a great option, but I would almost veer towards more so using treatments, so specifically serums, um, acids, masks. Yeah. Um, so specifically, I love BHA, so salicylic acid when it comes to congestion. Azelaic acid is a great one, just because not only does it help with the congestion, but also there's that benefit of pigmentation mm. um, improvement because of course um, breakouts and hyperpigmentation come hand in hand. So azelaic acid is gonna address those two things all in one. Um, and then also of course more anti-inflammatory ingredients. Um, so things like you know niacinamide, zinc, um, witch hazel. Um, so all of those ingredients are gonna be best for um, breakout prone skin. Amazing, I mean that's one concern that I I've really learned about my skin actually. Mm. If if I have a breakout, the breakout's actually fine. It's the next three, four weeks of trying to deal with the pigmentation, the kind of post-inflammatory pigmentation. Mm -hmm. So um, azelaic acid kind of treats both Absolutely. things. Treats Amazing. Both. That's really good. That's going into my yeah. skincare routine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, do you have any tips on um, layering skin care, especially mm. when you're in a bit of a rush? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, so when it comes to layering skin care, the general principle is that you start with the um, product that's sort of the most wateriest or lightest first, and then finish off with the most thickest, oiliest um, product. Yeah. So that's the general principle when it comes to layering. Um, in terms of doing it in a rush, I'm the queen of rush <laughs> but effective sort of skin care. Um, Again, I just like to mix them all in my hand. So I must sort of make, a, I would say almost like a custom moisturizer where I'm putting say a bit of my niacinamide serum mixed in with my favorite day cream, mixed in with my favorite sunscreen. Again, all in um, the appropriate amounts, mix together, put it on my face, done. Amazing. Just so much easier. So much easier. <laughs> I mean, that's 
Yeah, totally genius. Um, what is good? Oh, this is a question I am really mm -hmm. keen to know the answer for. Um, are there anything that, or any ingredients or any products that are really good for dark circles? Mm, really, really good question. Um, again, it's something that I see a ton in clinic. And I think really we need to be cognizant of what are some of the causes when it comes to dark circles. Yes, it can be due to pigmentation, which I often find particularly with, um, say, you know, my Africa Caribbean patients, my South Asian patients, it's typically genetic, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but also um, dark circles can be due to things such as volume loss. Um, so that's where considering if you want, again, I'm not forcing anyone, if you want, <laughs> Um, you know, exploring the world of injectables just to help with that volume loss can be really useful. And then, of course, lastly, you can get dark circles from the fact that the skin around the eye is a lot thinner. And so um, that sort of gray, purple, blue appearance can just be due to the fact that all the blood vessels there are just peeping through. Um, in terms of specific um, ingredients that I'd recommend for dark circles, I love um, transanamic acid um, and also uh, vitamin K that's really gonna to help to the under eye area. And then also just more sort of easier measures like um, you know, using um, you know, cool globes, more sort of cooling eye masks, things like that. And that will kind of, will that help with the sort of puffiness? Absolutely, the eyes? Yeah. absolutely. Um, okay, um, any good moisturizers? Mm. I feel like we've kind of covered this in, in certain um, parts of the session, but any really good moisturizers for wrinkles? Mm, really good question. Um, again, wrinkles can be due to, of course, you know, that um, collagen breakdown just through biological aging, but also it can be due to dehydration. That's a real sort of overlooked cause. So if it is partly due to dehydration, just making sure that you have um, an, you know, a moisturizer that's really rich with hydrate ingredients. Um, and then also, um, if it's more so just due to, you know, that collagen breakdown, um, sort of reasons due to aging, definitely um, a moisturizer that contains retinoids. That's what you need. If you can't handle retinoids, um, you might want to consider um, a moisturizer that contains Picuchiol. That's a great plant-based alternative to retinol. Amazing. And that is in the new Ren product, yes. isn't it? Yeah. It should be coming up on um, in the chat box. Mm -hmm. um, but so that uses almost a plant-based alternative to retinol, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so that's, yeah, I mean, is that quite a good option if you almost kind of find traditional retinols a bit dry and flaky and, and that sort of thing? Absolutely, that's a great option if you, you know, you can't quite handle retinoids, if you're new on the journey when it comes to using such products. Again, if you're someone that has, you know, redness, rosacea type skin, and then also Bacuchiol is safe to use um, in pregnancy and breastfeeding too. Amazing. How do you keep up with all of the products, <laughs> honestly? Have you seen my flat? Um, <laughs> those that know me, it's it's a shop. It's, honestly, I mean, it's really bad. And as a, as a sort of, um, uh, as a doctor, do yeah. you, are you sort of, um, sort of really impressed by actually what is out there now mm. for the skin compared to maybe five years ago or 10 years ago. Yeah, I'm super impressed and it's, you know, there really is something for everyone out there. And I think formulations have just taken to a whole new level. And I think that's partly obviously due to just new techniques, new technology, but also I think there's been a real sort of democratization of beauty as well. And I think consumers are really holding these brands accountable and constantly almost forcing them to, to innovate and, and and give better results with their products. We were just talking about um, before our session how um, you know five years ago finding an SPF that didn't leave your skin ashy mm -hmm. was a challenge. A real challenge and even now in 2021 to a degree sometimes it's a bit of a challenge whenever you know I get um, you know a press box of products and it's an SPF, I often have to hold my breath and do a quick, you know, <laughs> we were doing it earlier yeah, on, we were doing a test. quick swatch <laughs> test, you know, and okay, maybe it might blend in, but how much effort did it take for it to blend in, you know? Um, so yeah. Yeah, these, uh, the Murad products actually that we have here, yes. uh, blend in quite well, don't they? Blends very well. Um, I don't know if I should demonstrate it right now, just yes. so everyone I can see. Just so great. then you know I'm not lying. <laughs> yeah, it does um, work. <laughs> it generally works. And also, to be honest with you, Murad as a whole, fantastic brand, a very overlooked brand when it comes to sunscreens. 
Um, they have different formulations um, for more of an oily skin type, like they have um, a blue one, which is, I believe, called oil and pore control. Yes. A lot of my oily skin patients adore that. Um, and then also their city defense as well is really nice. Mm, amazing. So, yeah. And that's, I mean, you put in a quite, put on quite a sizable amount of SPF on your hand there. And it's just vanished. And it's gone. That's, I love that. And it leaves a nice texture, doesn't it? A really nice, nice texture, yeah. nice glow. Something like this, and particularly in the hotter months, I would actually just wear by itself without a moisturizer. Ah, amazing. Um, what do you think of tinted moisturizers? Mm. <laughs> I love tinted moisturizers, but again, I don't know whether you'll maybe share the same sentiment. For the longest time, I haven't been able to enjoy them just from a shade match point of view. Oh, gosh, yeah. Um, and it's kind of like I'm just presented with the dark and deep dark and, yeah, I need yeah. a little bit more. So I don't think I fully have tapped into the power of tinted moisturizers. <laughs> I know brands like Fenty, of course, um, Laura Mercier are always pushing the envelope when it comes to tinted moisturizers. Um, so we've uh, another interesting question. Should you remove facial hair? before using moisturizers and how would you do that? Um, interesting question. Yeah. Or like your views on, on, on facial hair removal yeah. perhaps in relation to skincare. Yeah, really good question. So again, I see this a lot in clinic. Um, my patients, which are of course predominantly women, removing the, their facial hair in weird and wonderful ways. <laughs> and they don't need to tell me that they remove their hair in weird and wonderful ways, I can tell. Why? Because particularly to the lower face, I can see pigmentation, scarring. Oh, wow. Yeah, so um, if you do kind of suffer with, you know, very obvious facial hair, definitely consider just getting laser. Please do not pick with your fingers. Please do not tweeze. Please do not shave. Please do not do that. Just go get laser. And then not only will it help to reduce, you know, the hair growth, but also I find coincidentally, um, laser hair removal does improve the texture of the skin there too. Mm. Um, but actually, interestingly, yesterday I did a bit of dermaplaning on my skin, which as well as removing some of those dead skin cells, it does remove what we call vellus hair, um, which is very different to say the hair on your head or your sideburns. Um, it's more sort of that fluff yeah. um, sort of hair. Um, and I love doing that, uh, particularly with an oil or even sometimes dry, though again, be careful doing it at home, guys, before you cut yourself. Um, but in that sort of a situation, um, I dermaplaned with an oil and then afterwards, I used um, an exfoliating toner, um, a really mild one. Again, I know my skin type. I have yep. more of a resilient, oily skin type, so I can get away with that combination. <laughs> um, but again, using something like um, the Press and Glow, it just means that any sort of, I can get that extra exfoliation. And also sometimes post hair removal, I'm very prone to bumps as well. Right. So I find that using a toner just helps to mitigate that. Amazing, oh, that's such good, such good tips. Um, what do you like to use around your eyes in terms of protecting mm. the eyes? Really good question. And fun fact, for the longest time even, I didn't use um, an eye cream. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, so um, for the longest time, what I actually did is just use my facial moisturizer <laughs> as an eye cream. Um, I think partly I just wasn't convinced. Um, again, this is very much at the beginning of my career. I wasn't really convinced that eye creams really worth the extra pennies or yes. too dissimilar to um, you know the formulation of an eye cream um, but now what I love to use is um, an eye cream by Ren um, it's um, from their dark spot correction range um, and it's for dark circles absolutely adore this eye cream again I get so many products that come through so the fact I'm actually consistent with this one product is amazing and I find that you know, I do see a real difference to the brightness to my under eye. And also it's the only un, um, under eye cream that hasn't broken me out or given me sort of a rash. Oh, amazing, mm. that's really interesting. So when it comes to eye creams, mm. it's kind of less better? Less is better, generally speaking, because for most people, um, the eye area is more sensitive than the rest of your face. Um, of course, though, if you're someone that has concerns around sort of aging, crepiness, um, and lines to the eye area, you might want to use um, an eye cream that has a tiny bit of retinoid. So La Roche-Posay have um, um, an eye cream called Redermic, um, tested for the eye, tested it myself, and hasn't caused any issues. 
So would that potentially help with um, sort of any fine lines or dark circles or in, you know, around absolutely, the eyes? Absolutely, absolutely. Amazing, okay, I need to add that to my list. <laughs> um, amazing, we've had so many questions and we've had such a great session. I feel mm. like I've just blurted out so many questions to you. I feel and like I've been blurting at you, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> it's been brilliant, but I've learned so much. And honestly, from our, I can see from our viewers that mm. we've, um, we've had such sort of great comments when it comes to um, all of the kind of amazing insights that you've been sharing. Thank you so much, yeah, Dr. Uwema. It's been great. Um, we've one last question I think I can see up there is um, about laser hair removal. Mm. Any, any machines that you'd recommend? Because I know obviously you've got mm. quite a lot of gadgets mm. uh, in your clinic yourself. Yeah, yeah. Again, it really depends on the skin tone. Um, so I think for the longest time, traditionally, you know, we felt that or kind of the consensus on the street has been darker skin tones can't have laser hair yeah. removal. That's not true anymore. Um, so definitely for darker skin tones, I'd gravitate towards more of an ND YAG um, sort of laser. For fairer skin types, again, um, an ND YAG would be fine, but also you can get away with things like IPL, um, Alexandrite. And then in terms of a specific machine, so this is something um, that you can ask the clinic that you're interested in. I love the Soprano machines. Mm. I've tried some other ones, I'm not gonna name names. Um, and some of the other machines have been very painful. Again, traditionally, if anyone, dark skin tones tend to find laser hair removal more uncomfortable, I certainly do. Um, but the Soprano machines, it kind of just, um, it's a probe and it glides along the skin with um, a bit of um, ultrasound jelly. <sighs> Beautiful and painless too, really, really good. I've actually used that myself. Have you? The Soprano what did you was think? excellent. So good and right. painless. Virtually so, so painless. good. Um, and I feel like we need to get you back on because <laughs> we had a bit of a chat before our session mm. about some beauty tools and mm. tweakments and treatments, yeah. <laughs> which, <clears throat> I mean, I could have spoken to you for a good solid hour okay. before our session <laughs> on that alone. So we definitely need to get you on um, on again. Thank you so yeah, much you, for Sonia. your time, Dr. Oema. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for the audience for watching and for all your fantastic questions. So I hope to see you then. And thank you so much, Dr. Oyman. I hope thank everyone's you. really enjoyed the session tonight.